fled from a country where they kill me because of my look and ethnicity and came to a country where I have to prove myself to be accepted. Forgetting the feeling of motherland and only understanding it by definition. Unfortunately, racism exists everywhere, also in my country, Afghanistan. I belong to a community called Hazara, and this community is facing genocide for 130 years. And why? Because of racism. Racism can appear in lots of forms. It can be extreme, like a genocide. It can be extreme, like a genocide, which is the case in my country, but it can also appear in ways that we might think it's not urgent to fight. Through genocide, you could kill someone physically, but through discrimination, you could kill someone emotionally and mentally. I remember when me and my sister was, uh, I remember when me and my sister were trying to figure out who we can approach for help since the teachers didn't care about the fact that my sister was being discriminated nearly every day. My sister was discriminated for wearing the hijab, her German knowledge, and simply being a refugee. This is not the only case. A lot of migrant children get discriminated every day in school, and that can cause mental health problems. For instance, losing motivation, confidence, self-esteem, and having doubts about future education and career. And yet, there is a sign in front of every school that says, school without racism, school with courage. So how can we help people that are going through this? We should create spaces for students to talk about this freely, and there should be someone responsible who truly cares, listens, and helps affected students. We must educate students more about politics and racism in schools. In general, we need spaces where children and young people from every nationality can come together, do political work, exchange experiences, and organize events. This can help them get more confident and see that they are not alone. Migrant parents also go through lots of challenges in the society, and I think it's mostly language and work related. There are so many people who want to contribute something to the society, but they keep getting rejected when they apply for jobs. To help you understand this issue better, I would like to talk about my parents as an example. My father learned German and got a very good qualification in welding. Um, they told him to do internships to increase his chances of finding a job. So he did months of internship, hoping he would get a job. The companies told him that they would hire him after a couple, a couple weeks of internship. And every time he was rejected after it. And every time he was disappointed, he doubted his skills, but I knew his skills were not the problem. I still remember how this all affected his mental health. Now he's working as a temporary worker in a small country with minimum wage. So as you may know, there are not many doors open for migrant parents. They must take what is given to them. No chances, no negotiations, no choices. But it's even more difficult for my mother. She left everything behind so me and my siblings could have a safe and better life. In order to do that, she had to face lots of challenges in a, as a hijabi woman in Germany. She learned German very fast and applied for lots of jobs. And yes, as you may know, she was rejected by all of them. They also told her to do internships. So she worked months in gastronomy, nursing homes, etc., hoping they would hire her after seeing how good she is. But no, they were using her as a free worker. Until now, I can say she went to so many job interviews and so many work trials, but she always got rejected. 
One time, a woman who helped her with documents for application suggested her to take the hijab off in order, or in order to find a job. In the nursing home, they treated her very badly and told her to do all the washing and cleaning as they were drinking coffee. It's so sad that in 21st century, people are still getting excluded and discriminated for looking a certain way. And we still have to discuss about it, that racism exists. And people are indeed struggling in, a, in this apparently ideal society. As you can see, it's much harder for my mother because hijab represents Islam and our nationality very clearly. But until this day, she never gave up. And it's also our responsibility not to give up. We should never give up fighting for a tomorrow when no one is disadvantaged or discriminated for how they look or what they believe in. These difficulties aside, I want to talk about how the incident of 2018 put more pressure on migrants and how it became so extreme. I believe media plays a very important role in representing migrants. And unfortunately, what, is of, what it often does is misrepresenting. What we need is accurate representation. For example, migrants lead many various successful businesses, so they have a very significant impact on the economy of Germany. And we also can't forget that Germany needed young people and workers. To largely report in negative context will lead to generalization, conflicts, and bad reputation of migrants and foreigners. If someone is a terrorist, then he is a terrorist and nothing more. It's not the religion or the nationality. This was the case in 2018 in Chemnitz when a person killed a German Cuban citizen. You could feel that nobody from the migrant community felt safe anymore because we knew that now right-wing extremists have the courage and the motivation to attack us. That's led to lots of changes in the migrant community. The majority didn't want to stay here anymore because they felt unsafe and didn't see career opportunities for people of color. Also, some women stop wearing hijab because they saw that the price they are paying for wearing the hijab in a society where it's full of prejudices against Islam is too high. Chemnitz was a very complex city for me. Yes, I experienced racism, but I also met incredibly kind and generous people, teachers, classmates, friends, and activists that helped me get through everything and gave me hope to fight for a better future. Despite all the problems, I am thankful for being in a country that offers me a safe place to be and the opportunity for free education. I have the privilege to stand here and speak up and talk to people who are also fighting for peace and justice. But not everyone has this opportunity. Like the 60 girls who died on September 30 in the Kaj Education Center in Kabul. They were victims of racism and genocide. So I want to use this opportunity to be the voice of people who are facing genocide for over a century, but nobody hears them out. Marzia was one of them, and here she wrote down her dreams. I want you to take a moment and read it. On the white pages of her notebook, she outlined her life. On the top of the page, the date reads September 10th, 2016. The outdated diary did not matter for Marzia, a Hazara girl from Afghanistan. To her, any empty page meant an opportunity to draw a world for herself. To her, dreams did not expire. She grabbed her pen and titled the page, Small Dreams Yet Favorites. 
holding her pen between her fingers, she let the blue run on every line. Marzia wrote, when freedom knocks at my door, I would walk her through my dreams. Today, what is left of Marzia? Unfulfilled dreams and a novel yet to be written. The bright day turned dark when nightmares took away the dreamers of my country in classrooms. Buried with her books, what will happen when freedom arrives looking for Marzia? Will she despise the cursed land that killed its future? The land that denies the history of Hazaras run deep in its veins. Today, an empty chair in an Italian restaurant, a white diary page, an unfinished novel mourns for the children of Koch. I wonder what this motherland would be without her daughters, without the children of Koch, without her young dreamers. This touching poem is from a talented Afghan poet named Zahra Wakilzada. For those who don't know, Hazaras are people, uh, are people that are native to the country we call Afghanistan today and have a long history of persecution. They are the most persecuted ethnic group in Afghanistan and are amongst the most persecuted ethnic groups in the world. Hazaras are also one of the largest groups of asylum seekers and refugees. There are few reasons why Hazaras are being killed. One of them is the religious aspect, which is, the following, which is following the Shia Islam. The recent reason is that Hazaras supported the presence of international community in the last 20 years in, in, with, in Afghanistan because they are very liberal and support democracy. So Taliban being the opposite of that, see us as a threat to their ideology. And there is the historical aspect. Discrimination, persecution and exclusion against the Hazara community started in the late 1800s. The king of Afghanistan. In this time, Amir Abdurrahman massacred 60% of the Hazara population and sold women and children as slaves. He identified Hazaras as a threat to the ethnic Pashtun dominance and led brutal wars against Hazaras. And with that, leaving them two choices, which were either to convert to Sunni Islam or to die. There is a sentence remaining from that time which says Tajiks to Tajikistan, Uzbeks to Uzbekistan, and Hazaras to Goristan. And Goristan means graveyard. That shows the ongoing conflict between the many ethnicities living um, together in Afghanistan unable to unite themselves. Amir Abdul Rahman confiscated the lands and properties of Hazaras and distributed them amongst Pashtun tribes. Hazaras are being brutally murdered and attacked to this day. Only in the last eight years, there were at least 34 targeted attacks on the Hazara community. They mostly kill students, children, newborn babies, and their mothers. Taliban have the same ideology as Amir Abdul Rahman. They see us as infidels and have always attacked the Hazara community in the last 20 years. In 1998, in Mazar-e-Sharif, they killed 10,000 Hazaras in a span of 72 hours. They forced Hazaras out of their homes and mass shooted them in the streets. People were not allowed to bury their bodies and they were left on the streets to be eaten by the dogs. No matter if they were kings, presidents or Taliban, the Hazara community is getting killed systematically and constantly. All those are definitional elements of a genocide. To finally change something after those 130 years, we want a united nation to recognize this genocide and offer protection measures and hold the Taliban accountable for their actions. At this point, I want to mention the Taliban poisoned women to stop them from protesting after what happened in Kaj Education Center, and that led to death of some of those women. 
And for change to happen, we need more media coverage and activism. But there comes also the responsibility of the Afghans carry themselves, which is to finally unite among themselves and come to agreements to stand together strong. Writing this speech, uh, I found it quite hard to talk in detail about the racism I've experienced in Germany. Since I often wake up to news and videos of my people dying in Afghanistan. I wake up knowing women are banned from schools and universities. I wake up knowing I could be one of the women in college education center. And I ask myself why? Why is it that I'm here and not them? Those young women in college education center and thousands who died before them had so many dreams. And if they were in my place, they would probably be a better student, contribute so much more to the society and write better speeches than me. But here I am doing what I can for justice and I am asking you to do the same. Do what you can and spread awareness about what is going on in Afghanistan and especially the Hazara genocide. Please support the campaign hashtag Stop Hazara Genocide and post about it. Regardless of, um, if the people around you are interested in politics or not, you have to speak up about racism and don't let it become normal. Me by myself can't achieve anything, but we can achieve anything when we are united and everybody does their part. Thank you.